Okay, I did it. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Let's see. Cool, cool. So my uh, Zoom decided to be like, okay, I'm just going to log you out. Um, so I had to run around and try to figure out what my password is, wound up just resetting it. Um, almost got locked out of my account. So fun times. Let me see. I'm going to fill out the sign in sheet really quickly. If this is your first, um, if this is your first session, welcome. Welcome. Um, if I could have you drop your a um, your at zero zero student ID number, that would be perfect. But I should have everybody else's uh, who's been here before. Okay, so um, while I'm writing some stuff down, is there anything in particular you guys would like to cover in terms of lab material um, from today, Thursday, um, any lab material whatsoever? Or lecture material too. I can pull that up. Whatever you guys want to go over, we can take a look at it together. Can we go over differential and selective media data table once again? Yeah, of course. Plates and different organisms. Mm -hmm. So um, for the Monday or uh, for Monday, Wednesday, you guys today went over um, differential versus selective media. So anybody in the Tuesday, Thursday group, this is going to be a little bit of like a preface so that maybe when you get into class, it'll be a little bit more. Um, it'll be a little. Como se dice? Familiar. There we go. That's the word that I was looking for. Okay. So I'm going to pull up the um, PowerPoint slides. Okay. I also hate how um, Zoom doesn't let you minimize like the application if you're the host. So I basically just have to open a tab in front of it. Kind of annoying, but we will get by. Okay, selective versus differential media. So first, let's define what selective means. So selective, I'd like to think of like somebody saying, okay, you're going to grow and you're not going to grow. I'm selecting who is going to be here, right? And then differential means I'm basically like, like think of a pool party. Like this is like the best analogy I could do. So I don't care how old you were when you had a pool party, you had to have had a pool party if you lived in Bakersfield. So let's say you had a pool party and you were like, okay, I wanted these classmates to go. Well, you selected those classmates, right? And then you had a, a water gun fight. 
and you said, okay, you're on the green team and this is gonna be the red team. You then differentiated whatever was at your pool party. So that's kind of how um, the plates work because the plates selected what was gonna grow and what was gonna be able to populate the plate. And then the differential part of the plate basically just differentiates between two things. Does that make sense? Like I'm trying to give you guys a little bit of like a hyper analogy just to have you guys like think of it during the test because it's a lot, it's gonna be a lot easier to think of a pool party than all of these special science words during an actual exam. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Okay. No, I, every single time. Do I want Microsoft 365? No. So this is kind of what I was explaining with the selective versus differentiate, differential media. So th this is basically what I was going over. So selective, um, it isolates a group. The differential distinguishes, distinguishes certain things within that group. So selective is bigger than the differential. There's going to be more people in a bigger population in the selective area than the differential area. So does everybody understand the concept of selective versus differential media? And now remember a plate. So like a TSA plate that you guys have been working with so far, that's neither of these. It just shows plain growth. It is a nutrient uh, plate. So a plate can be selective or differential, or it could be selective and differential. Okay. Kind of went over this. Um, Let's skip the blood auger for now because I don't want to confuse you guys. <sighs> so this is the question. Did the organisms grow slash what change occurred with selective versus differential? So our MSA plates that we worked with, they're going to be the pink ones. So they stand for mannitol salt auger. That's all you need to know in order to figure out what's in this bad boy and what, how it affects the bacteria that grows on it. So mannitol is the sugar. The mannitol is like the food source that the bacteria like or don't like. Salt is part of the component of the uh, plate itself. The salt content of most places, I guess, is only about 1%, um, even like your skin. It's not as high as 7.5. Um, so it's, it's extremely salty where we're going. So the MSA plate, it, ha it has the mantle sugar and a high salt component. What makes it selective is the salt component because either you're gonna, either the bacteria likes the salt and grows or it doesn't like it and doesn't grow. This is selective. This plate is selective for halophiles. Okay. What makes it a differential plate, because an MSA plate is both selective and differential, what makes it a differential plate is that it has the mannitol sugar and the phenol red pH indicator. So if a bacteria likes to ferment mannitol, it will ferment it and produce an acidic byproduct, which is indicated with the phenol red turning yellow. The phenol red is what gives that plate the pink color. Okay. But the thing is, a bacteria can grow on an MSA plate. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it it's going to ferment this mannitol. Okay, so this it's there's two different 
things that can happen if it grows. It can either ferment the mannitol or not ferment it. Okay. So I'm talking slowly because this is 100% going to be on the exam and something you'll need to know for the rest of the course. It's one of those key concepts. So for the MSA plate, here, I'm gonna change the slide. Don't worry about what's going on. For the MSA plate, what are the components of the plate? Mannitol salt. Mannitol sugar and the salt, yes. One more thing. Ag is it agar? What was it? Agar or no? Mm, no, not necessarily. What's, what's the other thing that's kind of tied to the mannitol? Phenol red. The phenol red. There you go. So the phenol red is going to be able to tell us if they ferment the mannitol. Those are your main components of the MSA plate. All right. So we're good on MSA. I know, I'm sorry, Tuesday, Thursday, it might be a little confusing, but I hope this gives a good preface. Okay, so uh, for the MSA plate, remember that a lot of our staff species are going to be on this plate. And just so you guys know, staff lives on our skin all the time. Um, staff likes our skin so much because, you know, we sweat we and we produce the sweat and it's salty. They like that salty environment. Also, I, I want to say that it's in your lecture material, but in Yellowstone, I'm repping Yellowstone merch, um, they have those, um, I forget what they're called, but you know how they are like a crisp, like a very clear blue and they have their rings of orange and yellow. Those are very salty environments and halo files like to live there. And when halo, and that, those could be um, staff species. So the more you know. Halo um, files are salt, uh, salt liking organisms, right? Yes. Or I, okay, I thought of this and I thought it was kind of funny because it reminded me, okay, let me open up in this paint. I just thought of this while I was like in class listening to this lecture for the second time. Can you guys see my MS paint or no? We can see your MS Manitol Salt Agar slide. Okay, let me share my screen here. So I don't know if this will help you remember it, but I thought it was kind of fun. So basically I just thought of like, come on brush, give me a color. Like it's Valentine's day coming up. So what are halo files like? They love salt. I know my, oh wait, haha. <laughs> I for, keep forgetting I have a touchscreen computer and I just draw like a little salt shaker That's kind of a janky salt shaker, but I just thought of like a little heart halo files in a salt shaker. It's like, it's kind of one of those things that like, I don't know, if it helps you remember it, sure. If there's other little drawings that you can kind of put in, um, those are fun too. But like, if it's funny, you'll remember it. I promise you that. So that's my two cents. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that. But, you know, anything that helps you remember it. But halophiles love salt. That is their, that's their whole shtick. Okay. And then you guys, I'm kind of spoiling the lab, but this is what happens when the mannitol ferments, right? These are both halophiles. This is a mannitol fermenting uh, staph species. And this is not a hal uh, uh, mannitol fermenting staph species. So we see how the plate selected those two bacteria to go to the party, but we can see that Staph aureus is on the yellow team and um, Staph epidermidis is on the pink team, right? I don't know, just saying. Okay, okay, so 
as funny of a word as makanki is, I just love saying it. Makanki is just hilarious to me. Uh, we will not be learning the specifics about makanki agar, but EMB or eosin Y methylene blue agar, um, we will be learning about. <sighs> so EMB plates. Um, so the the selective portion of the plate is whether it's um, going to be gram positive or gram negative. Let me get to that one. So um, the, yes, it's going to be gram positive or gram negative is the selective part of it. So there are, let's see, there's three components. There's going to be three components to this plate as well. The eosin Y, the methylene blue, and the lactose. Remember how mannitol was the sugar for the MSA plate? The sugar for this plate is lactose. So our gram or negative organisms are going to grow. What differentiates this is if they are going to ferment the lactose. So when they ferment the lactose, they're going to be either pink, purple, or green. The metallic green color, it's kind of hard to get in class. Only a few of us were ever able to do it. Um, and it just kind of depends on what your culture looks like. If it's really dense with E. coli, if you grab a lot, if you grab a little, um, it just kind of depends. But um, that is what will show you the fermentation of the lactose. Does that make sense? Is the color change. So similar to the MSA, the EMB is showing a color change for the differential portion of the plate. So what is the question we ask when we're talking about something selective? If we're talking about a selective plate, what is the question we ask? Can it ferment mannitol? Not quite. It's I think a little bit broader. Yeah. Stuff growing or not? Yes. Perfect. If it's so it be, if we're asking ourselves, is it selective or about the selectivity of a plate? It's did it grow or did it not grow? Now, differential could be a whole slew of things, depending on what the um, plate is made out of, what the uh, different sugars are in it, things like that. Uh, that is going to be our differential aspect. That's going to change from different plate to different plate. So, so these two dyes are going to be what shows us the lactose fermentation, just like how the phenol red helps indicate the use of the mannitol, the eosin Y and methylene blue is going to indicate the use of the lactose. I think that you guys understand that bacteria will use these things, it's just mixing them up. So I'm trying to like restate it as much as possible. So Yes, let's see. This is a little bit of a, a strange picture, so I'm not going to really go over it, but you'll see in class what positive looks like. And I think that's the end. Yeah, that's the end. So any questions or anything that you guys maybe would like to see more examples of, any, any Confusion. So what does fermenter mean? So for MSA, it's a mannitol. We're looking at mannitol fermenter or not mannitol fermenter. And for EMBs, we're looking at lactose fermenter or no mm -hmm. lactose fermenter. So what does fermenter exactly mean? Like change color? So when, and so like what happens when bacteria uses something if and ferments it? What is basically happening is they're using it as their energy source. So the bacteria on an EMB plate, if they're a lactose fermenter, they'll take the lactose, 
they'll use it and create a byproduct. So let me go ahead and show you guys the um, the lecture slides because um, part of this is knowing, you know, um, it's there's the lecture that ties to the lab. So let me share my screen. I get lost so easily. Okay. Make it a little bit bigger. Please, please. There we go. So it's the fermentation is a metabolic pathway, right? Um so can eat hamburgers. That's so sad. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying to find the the slide, and it has a bunch of uh, different examples of hold on. You guys, have you guys gotten this far? How far have you guys gotten to this one? We've gone further. Okay, so our metabolic pathway is respiration. This is how we, um, this is how we use, how we take things in and use and create energy out of them so that we can move, we can perform all the things of life, right? Bacteria, they don't use respiration. They don't have lungs. They don't have uh, oxygen exchange like we do. They need fermentation. So let me try to find. Hmm. <laughs> okay, here, this is it. So we'll see we we're gonna see in the next lab for tuesday thursday and uh, we'll see the results monday wednesday uh on wednesday um but we'll see the result of this alcoholic fermentation pathway when we try to make wine we'll see the homolactic fermentation when we we don't necessarily make cheese but we'll make yogurt It'll curdle the, the milk a little bit. If we let it go long enough, it'll probably become cheese, but not good cheese. <laughs> not good cheese. Um, but the this is the whole this is the whole idea. So when we when we take our wine in lab, the sugar that we're using is going to be glucose because what is grape juice other than grapes and sugar? We're going to be using the sugar in the grape juice and the um, and the yeast in order to have the yeast eat up this grape juice and use this fermentation pathway to produce ethyl alcohol and CO2. That's why our balloon, when we put it on top of our flask, is going to inflate with CO2 and the ethyl alcohol is going to stay in the grape juice we're gonna see that pathway actually happen. Same thing with the lactic acid pathway. So we're going to see the lactose, which is the sugar and milk. We're gonna see that go through this process and curdle and produce lactic acid, which will make it stiffer. It's going to make it, uh, yeah, just chunky. So this, Fermentation is just the pathway in which in a bacteria or other organism takes a sugar source and uses it for energy. And it usually has some sort of byproduct. So it's not always going to be one of the easy routes like an alcoholic fermentation. Um, and you'll never really need to be like, okay, well, Staph aureus does this specific fermentation path. Um, and you won't need that and know that for every single bacteria. Um, some scientists are still finding bacteria and they don't know what their fermentation pathway is. Some of them 
you know, there's always the weird ones. So we just need to know that they're, what they're using and how they're using. Does that make sense? Fermentation is just a way to use energy. But this slide is going to be very helpful, um, especially when it comes time to exam class. I have a chat. Can you also explain the tetracycline sensitivity portion of lab four? Yeah, of course. So the tetracycline sensitivity, let's see. I want to say that this is, it's not going to be on this slideshow. Let's, let me pull up and see if I can do another one. Hmm. I want to see, I think it's on this one. I'll, I'll double check this one. But so do you guys know what tetracycline is? Like in terms of like what kind of drug it is? Antibiotic? Yeah, it's an antibiotic. So let's break that down. So if you've ever had any type of infection, yes, it targets the ribosome. So if you've ever had any type of infection, you take an antibiotic and it's supposed to kill the bacteria that's just hanging out inside of you, living rent-free, try to get it out of there. So, so if we're targeting this bacteria, we can target it in, in different ways. So I remember talking about why is it important to know the gram stain and why is it important to know the differences in our cell walls? Well, the differences in our cell walls helps us, you know, target the bacteria. So it's important to take a gram stain of a wound culture so that we can see what type of bacteria are there and try to distinguish what um, what would be the best mode of action, right? So um, so if it's if it has a thick peptidoglycan and we have an antibiotic that's going to target peptidoglycan synthesis, then we're going to want to give them that. We don't want it to target something else that maybe the bacteria doesn't even have or the bacteria is, I don't know, it's just not built to be sensitive to that. And it's gonna take more of that antibiotic to try to kill it. Um, we don't wanna do something like that because it's going to delay the recovery of our patient. So, um, so when we talk about what, the te tetracycline does. So tetracycline targets the ribosome. We know that most bacteria, actually, I think all, don't quote me because there's always gotta be some kind of weird outlier, but most bacteria, especially the bacteria that you handle in lab is going to have ribosomes. We have ribosomes. At like a lot, a lot of things that do metabolic pathways have ribosomes. So with that in mind, if we give an antibiotic to a bacteria that has ribosomes and it targets the ribosomes, is it going to be effective? Yes, it's targeting yeah. the ribosomes. Yes, you're correct. So when people say that it's about equal, it's because they both have ribosomes and if it targets it, then it should be about equal. The reason why people say that gram negative are a little less sensitive, so more resistant, they, they don't get as impacted by tetracycline, is the fact that they have that outer membrane. It acts as like a second shield, because remember they have the outer membrane, they have their um, thin peptidoglycan, 
a pair plastic space and then another layer. So they have a lot of layers. It's like an onion, Shrek fans. But um, that those layers prevent it from getting too deep and especially at the ribosomal level. But remember gram positive, it has that thick peptidoglycan and only one phospholipid bilayer. And remember those phospholipid bilayers, they have selective permeability. So if let's let's think about it like this. If you have to go to through TSA and you have a questionable item on you, you might be able to make it through once, but twice, forget it. That's kind of how you have to view it. Um, I kind of hate TSA, but that's a story in and of itself. So that's why we can see that tetracycline can can be effective on gram positive, but less so on gram negative. But it is still technically correct if you say that they would both be about equal. If that answers your question, okay, perfect. So, any other questions about anything talked about in class or anything like that? So, positive, yeah. the thick peptidoglycan, that's the gram positive, correct? Yes. They're more resistant or they have a more sensitivity to penicillin, correct? So, they are more sensitive to penicillin and less, resist less resistant. Does that mean being more sensitive, you would need more penicillin to get rid of the gram positive? If you have a gram positive, you don't need too much because they're, because they're sensitive. So if like, you know, think about like being sensitive as in like words hurt, right? Um, words do hurt, but I'm just trying to give you guys kind of like a, like a brain bridge, if you will. So if words hurt and I'm more sensitive to words than maybe somebody else, less words are needed for me to feel the impact, if that makes sense, than somebody else. So if I'm more sensitive and less resistant, then I'm going to feel it more with less. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay. My biggest like um, like pieces of advice is those big key idea um, slides that are basically just all just one big picture, and she spends a couple minutes on it explaining it. Redraw those, redraw them, either exactly or in your own way. It helps you commit it to memory. So how are we feeling? Good, so so. Who's stressed about the exam? That's coming up next week. Does she curve? Does she curve? She uh she does not curve. Oh, if you bring to attention a question that was misspelled, she might give you and other people who had that question the point back, but she does not curve. I don't want to uh, flood your guys too much. So why don't we take a five minute break? I'm going to, because Zoom does this stupid thing where I can't run for more than 40 minutes. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to close down the entire uh, meeting and uh, we'll, I'll restart it in five minutes. I'll give you guys an extra minute. So at 5.42, at 5.42, you guys can come back and we'll look at some review questions if you guys like, or if you guys can think of any more questions while you absorb this information, I'll answer those too. Okay. All right, I'm gonna kick you guys all out and I'll see you in five minutes. 